Hi, I'm Jeffrey Stuffings from Jester King Brewery, and I'm here to give you your craft beer and brewing tip of the week. Really, time is the most kind of expensive ingredient in our beers, and you know, some, in some cases, like the majority of that time is the bottle conditioning phase. Some of the things that we see during the bottle conditioning phase Initially, and again, keep in mind this is mixed culture fermentation. You probably, I'd be very surprised if you see this in pure culture, is you're gonna see just this bloom of diacetyl. It doesn't always happen, but we see that a lot where, you know, sometimes it's jarring and disconcerting where you just spent all this time like aging this beer, or maybe it's just a beer that wasn't aged, but you're just really proud of it. And then you put it in the bottle and open it 24 hours after bottling, you're like, where'd the beer go? Like it just totally got screwed up. And we've just learned from experience that, you know, that keep in mind there is Brett in our mixed culture, that the Brett will reabsorb that diacetyl and ultimately lead to a beer with kind of like just new nuanced flavors, whether it be like, like in our case, we get a lot of like stone fruit during the bottle conditioning phase. So we've learned not to panic when something we've spent a lot of time and energy and you know, emotional and time investment into creating goes sideways for a period when it's in the bottle. But all, all in all, I'd say it's more than just getting bubbles into beer. It's a, about continued flavor and aroma development. And again, it's kind of what you're after. If you just want these beers to be presented like fresh and hoppy and floral, release them young. Uh, or force carb them. There's no crime in force carbing, carbing them. I think for beers that are really more yeast driven, it's a crucial phase of the process to bottle conditioning, but not an essential one. So it's really kind of, I, I think, what you're, you're after ultimately. Temperatures for bottle conditioning are important, but not a deal breaker. And what I mean by that is, you know, with primary fermentation, if we don't hit our numbers temperature wise, the beer is gonna be very different than what we intended. Bottle conditioning wise, I find that lower temperatures impede the process by which the beer continues to develop in the bottle, but doesn't necessarily like fundamentally alter it based on where we know from experience the beer is likely to head. With that said, we do try to get our temperatures in the 70s, mainly just from a frustrating standpoint that if we don't maintain that temperature, the beer is gonna be very slow to condition especially our high gravity beers. I mean, for instance, we did a beer that was aged in mezcal barrels uh, that was about, you know, around 10% alcohol, mixed fermentation, and it took like six months to condition. It ultimately got there, but the beer went all the way through the winter time without much development, and then once, once the spring rolled around, it started to finally, you know, reach the levels of CO2 that we like to see in our finished beer. The type of bottle you use is a fun thing to kind of focus on. Green glass is something, you know, I mentioned, you know, one person's off flavor is another person's attribute. And green glass is kind of a polarizing thing. Hops, as they degrade in the presence of light, you know, give off kind of, I would say, kind of this like light struck, some, sometimes described as cardboard, sometimes described as like, you know, skunky, you know, character. The amber bottles are quite good. I mean, I, I think they're, you know, marketed as having like, you know, 95 to 99% UV protection, where green bottles, I forget what the percentage is, but it's, it's lower than that. And then you can go all the way down to clear bottles, which, you know, basically have no UV protection. For beers that are really like hop driven, sometimes we choose amber, but sometimes we choose green because we kind of like that skunk, or sometimes I like to say kind of that like Euro skunk character, which I just came to appreciate from drinking like hoppy farmhouse ales from Europe. They, from what I've been able to ascertain, historically used green glass for, you know, economic and practical reasons. We in the modern context have the luxury to use something that you know, people may have historically used out of practicality, we're using because we like the flavor impact of that. And green, green glass, I think, is just so much fun. And for more on brewing rustic farmhouse and table beers, please click on the link below.